Welcome to Fluke Hall. Is there anybody here who hasn't been to Fluke before? Congratulations on finding us. I know it's actually really hard. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You're at uh, Fundamentals for Startups. This is a program that we run throughout the school year uh, with experts in the Seattle area on various aspects of local startups. Um, I wanted to tell you about some other events we have coming up. Uh, next week, over in Startup Hall, if you're familiar with that, that's over on um, uh, one, let's see, 1100 Northeast Campus Parkway. It's in the old Condon Law Building. Uh, really great place, really great business space, uh, an incubator there. Um, they are having Waffle Wednesday, which is a great way to get introduced to Startup Hall. Um, they make these righteous waffles. They have all the different toppings. Go over, hang out, talk to people who are from startups who have come from all over Seattle, uh, and that's a great one. Next Friday in the same space, we're going to have Lawrence Lerner presenting on startup leadership. He's been a founder, an investor, a CTO, and he's currently the head of Lerner Consulting. They do all kinds of business transi transitions, uh, any kind of business change uh, might bring in Lerner Consulting, but uh, he's specializing right now a lot in blockchain. So if you also have a very avid interest in blockchain technology, he's a really good guy to talk to about. Talk with that about. And next week is also our first uh, ELC meeting. Um, that'll happen right after the fundamentals lecture. Um, the ELC is the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic here at the University of Washington. Uh, the law school has a number of different legal clinics where people can go for free or low cost uh, legal advising. And the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic comes in and gives a somewhat shorter presentation about various aspects of startup law. Next week will be, when do you hire a lawyer? Um, on Tuesday, the 23rd, over at the Hub, if you have ever thought about um, doing Amazon Catalyst, now is a great time to learn about it. It's only open to students, faculty, and staff of the University of Washington, uh, but they offer an initial $25,000 if your if your project gets funded, and then you can apply for another $75,000 in uh, grants from them uh, so that you can get something started. So if you've ever thought to yourself, hey, I have this great idea, I just need $10,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 to get it going, this might be your opportunity. So meet, meet over at the Hub uh, Tuesday, 123, from 5 to 6 p.m. You can also sign up on our website for the CoMotion event calendar. And then the following week, um, here in the space again, Martina Welkoff is going to be presenting Pitching 101. And he, she is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, she launched Convene VR. She launched Zealist. She's the board president of Seattle Women in Tech. Uh, she's in the World Economic Forum. Uh, she's, she's fantastic. You're going to love her. So please come back for that as well. And the ELC topic that day is going to be equity allocation, which will work very well with the Pitching 101. Today, we are extremely excited to have Greg Paley here. He's going to be talking about creating the business narrative, aka the minimum viable story. Uh, Greg is a collaborative advisor to founders, entrepreneurs, and investors in early stage and fast growth companies in technology, internet, and e-commerce. Uh, he's developed a bunch of leadership frameworks and management models that you can sort of step your company through, uh, bend the curve, the heart question, and the minimum viable story, which I think we'll be hearing more about today. Uh, allows companies to scale faster and smarter. He also advises professional investors so that they can efficiently monitor the progress and improve communications with their portfolio companies because a lot of the time when you have multiple investments, it is hard to keep track of what everybody else is doing. He supports stakeholders, founders, and entrepreneurs of startups and early stage companies as they strive to build great companies that make meaningful differences in the world. He founded New Media Holdings and is a current advisor at the Washington Small Business Development Center. Greg has a BA from Whitman College and a JD from Seattle University, and we are super excited to have him. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for that kind introduction. Everybody hear me OK? Great. Um, so we've all heard of minimum viable product, MVP, but um, I came up with this um, idea of MVS because during the course of uh, my advising with, um, with companies, I found that there was always a jumping ahead point where companies and founders were so excited to develop product, but they forgot to take the initial steps. And we're going to talk about some of those initial steps today. Um, I'm assuming that people are here because they're curious about um, techniques and ideas about raising funds. And so, um, quick poll, you can answer this question yourselves, but how many people are here because they're thinking about um, raising professional money, 
um, quitting your day job or maybe moonlighting while you're wearing multiple hats. Um, who's uh, formed a legal entity already? Okay, a few of you, thank you. And who has finished preparing their business plan? <laughs> See, that's not surprising. Um, in the context of a business plan, let me just share with you that there's multiple definitions of business plans. Um, you know, we have this concept of this magnum opus, of something that is just from soup to nuts, you know, 50 to 100 pages long, um, has all these elaborate projections. Um, I think that we can agree that that's old school and um, that's given way to this new uh, expectation with investors as well as stakeholders that we can streamline our narrative and deliver it quickly and efficiently without having people weed through a cumbersome document. Um, so a little bit of a background about how this came to, came to be. Um, this body of work was developed as a result of my practice as an attorney, um, but also the work that I've been doing the last few years volunteering and currently working with um, WSU with a uh, no cost, no fee, no equity program out of Redmond and Bellevue that provides this embedded advisory services for startups. But what I found in my many hundreds of conversations uh, working one-on-one -on -one with founders is that there's this tendency to jump right into the process and to get started and to create bank accounts, create corporations, um, ask people to quit their day jobs to start something new. Um, maybe they've hired a lawyer, uh, maybe they've developed a website. Uh, in the case of some clients, they've actually purchased inventory and equipment. Um, but Behind all those decisions, I found that there was a lack of a grouping of documents that would govern how that business was going to operate. So starting a business is easy, right? We could do it online, we can go down and get a business license. A lot of founders don't go through the machinations of hiring a lawyer, which is very expensive, um, but they just get started. So there's been a lot of noise and a lot of confusion about what business narratives means because it's a very fluid definition. So I started curating content, and I started registering and, and creating these, these business modules um, to help founders. So what I'm gonna share to you today, with you today is a condensed version of um, a couple of workshops that I do all day, um, and they're usually eight hours, where we actually have much more hands-on document prep and document review, and also peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And this is not working. Pardon me. It's okay. So um, here's the here is um, the premise. So what the data shows us is that companies. There's a multitude of reasons why companies um, fail, but we assume that companies fail because um, of lack of capital. And so if you start to look at some of the new data coming out, there's a clear tendency to demonstrate, at least from data collected by um, academic studies, that businesses are actually failing not for lack of capital, but for lack of planning. And so the sticky point is that we have all these preconceptions about why businesses fail, but it's almost um, counterintuitive to think that businesses really don't fail for lack of capital. Because if you think about um, the fact that we have sweat equity, right? And some of us can bootstrap, and some of us who are very good programmers or developers can actually do this, in other words, create um, certain early iterations of products without having any money. So I want you to think about if you have a startup now, um, was the lack of capital really a driving factor for the reason um, why you haven't grown? Or that maybe prohibited you from, from starting? 
So I want you to think about the planning issue. And I want you to ask yourselves throughout this discussion today whether or not you've taken the steps I'm outlining here about doing the adequate number or amount of planning that you need to have a viable business narrative. So th this, is a con this is in context of perspectives. And I want you to think about your narrative from multiple perspectives, but I want you to put it in the basket of having a framework. So if we're gonna to toss out the long-winded business plans and think about a more streamlined way of delivering our message, I want you to think about what that framework looks like because ultimately what we need to do is we need to connect with others. Right? If we're pitching, there has to be some connection between the speaker and the audience. And what we lose sight of is the fact that we need to go ahead and explain our business case in a commercially defensible way. This doesn't mean it has to be scientifically provable, but it has to be commercially defensible. And a lot of us founders overlook the fact that we're talking to people with various degrees of sophistication and expertise, and some of them may have some of those hard questions to ask us. So I want you to think about, if you're sitting on the other side of the, of the table, and you're analyzing your business in the, in the context as uh, a investor, what questions are you gonna ask yourself? So if you're the investor and you're hearing, your, hearing this pitch, what are you gonna think about it? And what criteria are you gonna use to evaluate whether or not you're gonna take the next steps and begin due diligence? So I want you to think about phrasing questions, okay? And I want you to think about applying an analytical framework that you can drive maximum amount of information from that discussion within a very short period of time. Because ultimately, we're not gonna invest in companies unless we feel confident about the management and the team, but also about the viability of the underlying business itself. So we're, our goal here is to, is to capture some idea. And the minimum viable story is getting us thinking about what ideas are essential to being able to offer and deliver an effective business narrative. Much of this storyline is, is delivering this plan for future growth. Because ultimately, our desire to get access to capital is to grow and scale our company, not necessarily to start it. But I want you to think about the creating this bundle of documents that we're gonna go into in a few minutes, and then making sure that as you begin to create these documents, the underlying theme behind that document creation is what? It's disclosure, right? Not in a legal sense, but we're disclosing to people who we're going to be hopefully doing business with that we have a certain degree of expertise over the subject matter that we're talking about, not just from a technical perspective, but from an operational and a business storytelling perspective. Because ultimately, in those documents, our job is to explain either current value, if we're going for our next rounds, or anticipated future value. So what are some of the essential uh, tools of, of, of storytelling? I want us to think in the context of models, and then I'm gonna sprinkle in a couple of other suggestions and tidbits for you to think about as you begin to craft this narrative. This process seems to be incredibly simple. We can go online, we can download a lot of documents, a lot of templates, we can look at examples of what's worked for others in the past and we can emulate that. But this is more than just filling in the blanks. And I can't, I can't count how many companies I've seen that have come in with some canned documentation where they essentially fill in the blanks. And we're lulled as founders into, this, into the sense that this is a very easy process because everything is driven by templates, but the templates are just, are just a signpost. Right? I mean, behind those signposts, we need a map. And this is a real challenge. A lot of the companies I've seen don't even have um, cash flow projections. They've gone right out, like I said, and they've tried to raise capital, but they haven't done the homework. So we have these two different silos, if you will, of information that we need to be able to create. And one is gonna be our business model, and the other silo is gonna contain our financial models. 
So back to our perspectives idea here for a moment. Let's start with what is it that we're selling? Ultimately, as founders, we're selling something, aren't we? Or we're offering something. And in that dialogue, what we're doing is we're inviting people to participate in our business journey. And we're asking them to help fund us as we grow and commercialize our business ideas. So what's the idea? Is it a product, is it a service, or is it a process? It's amazing to see how many founders who have great degrees, great training, great credentials, overlook the fact that it's very hard to take this very complicated concept of what they're trying to create and distill it down to a very bit, a few um, bite-sized nuggets. They forget to address issues like disrupting the status quo or how they're gonna fulfill the expectations of their, of their customers. So what we're offering in these conversations with the, with the investors or the audience is we're going to try to get them to understand that we can convey the meaning of value. What is the audience or the investor buying? Anybody want to answer that one? They're going to buy a story. Ultimately, they are going to determine whether or not they're going to invest in our business based upon the credibility of the information that we provide them to analyze, maybe in front of us, or maybe through due diligence. Or maybe in most cases, which we as founders overlook, is that the, um, the angel or super angel, depending on where, where you are in your, in your um, fundraising, may just hand off your packet to somebody who isn't well trained, but has been trained to look and issue spot and see whether or not the document covers the major categories. But in any bit of due diligence though, what we do is we need to be able to go ahead and understand without having to unearth every single section of the, of the, business, of the business summaries or, or the plans, what it is that is our value proposition. So I want you to think about that with respect to the audience is buying a narrative, they're buying credibility, and they're also going to start to use these initial documents as a building block to ask for more information. Maybe that's going to be a term sheet. So um, any questions about that? Okay. So the key point on what the audience is buying is think about this totality of documentation that we're gonna deliver them, deliver to them and make their job really easy. And think about what the attributes of success are gonna be there. The document has gotta be thorough. It's gotta be, go, it's gotta be consistent. It needs to have a certain level of disclosure. It needs to be logical. And it needs to be quantifiable. So how are we going to quantify our assumptions? So let's talk about some of the blueprints. We're going to, develop, we're going to deliver our value and our story through models. And there's two different sets of models we can use. We can use internal models or external models. I don't know how many of you founders have done this, but created two different sets of documents, but does anybody or has anybody ever created two sets of documents, one external facing as far as decks go and collateral and one internal facing? So when I meet with uh, founders and their teams, one of the issues that we always address is they have one set of documents that's, that's supposed to be fulfilling a lot of different services or functions. So one of the documents that they're using to raise, raise funding for is also being used in a haphazard way of driving their business models and their own level of accountability within their team. And it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. So although I advocate going ahead and creating two different sets of documents, we're gonna focus on the external facing documents. And the first document that comes to mind is gonna be this business summary. So the business summary, you can download the templates, but what I want to do is I want to just pepper in a couple of different um, ideas for you to take away to peel back the labels and get to the substance. How many of you have developed an elevator pitch? And how many of you have used it regularly? And do you find it effective or not? How many of you in your documents, in your executive summary, your one pager, talk about the immediacy, the immediacy of the problem? That this is a problem that exists now and not in the future. 
So I work with a lot of AR VR companies, and this is really interesting technology, but I have a lot of questions as to whether or not it's actually market ready. We have all these discussions about the large companies rolling out these, these $199 headsets, but they still aren't here. And so we have this really vibrant ecosystem of AR VR developers, and we just don't have the consumers and the traction yet to do it. So think about if you're in that, in that space, whether or not you're, you're, too, you're too far ahead of the market. What are we doing better that others aren't doing? I see a lot of executive summaries that don't have any competitive analysis. So it's labeled competitive analysis on the documentation, but there's no reference to any other companies within that competitive marketplace. So how, how are we going to evaluate the merits of our business opportunity if we haven't even done the research to figure out who else is in that system and who are our, our potential um, um, competitors? We need to talk about how fast our idea is going to catch on. And it's important to go ahead and to tie in our narrative in the executive summary to the projections, but how are we going to connect with our customers and how are we going to explain to the person who's reading all this information that we understand how to do that? How are we going to, how are we going to explain to the people who are going to be evaluating our, our business opportunity um, what the pain points are? What are the customer's pain points that we're solving specifically? And how do we understand or know that those pain points actually exist for the customers? Have we done a good enough job in talking about our product development and our runway and our users or our projected growth rates or our margin or our revenue projections? What problem are we trying to solve that is a current problem for existing customers? And how do we solve it? So think about the executive summary as one page. Think about the deck as no more than, than 10 slides. But it's important as you go through this preparatory process is when you're having a chance to go ahead and pitch at different events, they, they meaning the event organizers or the screening committee is gonna give you parameters to work within. And what we don't want to do is create a five deck, uh, a five, five slide deck, and then try to elaborate and create a 10 slide deck for another audience. What I suggest that we do is create the 10 to 12 slide deck and then peel it back. And we can have one master deck or one master executive summary, and then depending on what the audience wants, we can modify it accordingly. Financial models. There's only two financial models. There's one that talks about how we're gonna demonstrate our knowledge of how we're going to grow the company, and then another set of documents is how fast we're gonna burn through the money. I don't see very many cash flow projections. I see a lot of business modeling in the form of um, revenue projections, but they're two very distinct animals. I see a lot, of, a lot of situations where founders will go ahead and they'll arbitrarily plug in numbers because it may be a very nascent market, but there's no data and there's no underlying assumptions that they can use to validate how they arrived at those numbers. So the problem becomes is you get someone who's sophisticated, who is looking at investing in your business, and we can't even explain how we're gonna make the money. Oh, it doubles every, every six months. Well, I read this particular resource and that said that we should show these numbers this way. I had a client a couple of years ago who was in a great, great market um, who was told by a venture capitalist that they needed to show that they were going to hit $100 million in five years. It was impossible to do. So what they did was they worked backwards to get to that number. They start with 100 million and, and work back. And th the math didn't add up, it wasn't a logical sequence, um, but again, there's a lot of disinformation going around and what one set of investors want to capture is different from what others want to capture. So think about as you're going to go ahead and capture information or, and, and make that available, think about how fast you're gonna burn through the money. When are you gonna hire people? What inflection points are you gonna show, not only on your graphs, on your deck, but also in your projections? And how are you, how are you going to ensure that everything matches and flows logically? 
if you think about your own deck and your own collateral, does everything flow properly? Has it actually been scrutinized? Do you, can you show that everything ties in one logical form? I see some uh, founders uh, come in with, um, with hypothetical balance sheets and income statements. Um, they get these templates online and they try to create um, a, an accounting structure around a startup. And that's almost impossible to do because a lot of this is retrospective and we don't really know how to create those documents until we've already had um, some, uh, some miles on the tires. But it's surprising to see how many people try to do it that way. So we have our business models, our financial models, then there's this whole other category of supporting documentation that we need for our story. There are dozens of documents that we can provide or create, but I'm gonna focus on just a few. I suggest that having a SWOT analysis is really good to do. And you can say, well, that's business school 101, and you're right, it is. But how many, how many of you have a SWOT analysis? And if an investor asks to see your SWOT analysis, can you, can you provide it? And I've seen investors ask for, ask for that. Because what it shows the investor is that the analytical exercises that the founders are being expected to go through are actually being done. Co-founders agreements. That is part of your minimum viable story. It is absolutely, again, surprising to me how many young founders will start companies, get their LLC or get their, get their corporations, um, pay a lot of money to lawyers, and uh, just think that they need the corporation and don't have the supporting documentation. So again, there's a whole host of other documents that fit in there, but a co-founder's agreement is gonna be really, really important. Another uh, important document is gonna be your cap tables. Um, I see various cap tables that don't make any sense, and again, they're downloaded templates, um, and I don't know if the cells have been checked and the computations are right, but they're really messy. And if we start a due diligence process and produce some of the documentation that I've seen from people who have graduated with um, exceptional um, business backgrounds, uh, director level from publicly traded companies, uh, MBAs from top, top 10 schools, business schools, the cap tables are sticky and they need to be done properly. Uh, another supporting document in our story, again, keeping in mind we have an internal set of documents and an external, but if we have to go external with our documents, we gotta pull them from some, from some, some source because we're not gonna have the time to create all these documents on the fly. And if an investor wants to start due diligence, they're not gonna wanna wait three months because they have certain windows of opportunity and certain funds available, and that money may be, may be running out, and if it's an old fund or a closing fund, they're not gonna wait. So I want you to think about having an understanding of the cap tables, but also convertible notes. I had a, a client of mine who's uh, been pitching to one of our um, very large, well-known companies here in town. Has gone through and created an incredible product. Um, it's a very complicated product, um, and the founder and his team have done a great job. This founder was asked by this investor, um, what is your, what's your valuation cap? And the founder couldn't answer the question. And then unfortunately threw out a really silly number. And the problem is the credibility was lost right away because the homework wasn't done. The founder didn't take the time to create this basket of documents that we're calling the minimum viable story and make sure that everything flowed. So what happened was this investor got committed to a valuation cap that was so low that almost anybody would have, would have done the deal. And so what happens is it just polluted future rounds and the, and the company's having some, some real tough problems. And then another, uh, one last document um, would be the term sheets. Um, if you haven't seen term sheets um, and you can get some from some lawyers, please read them. Because again, time is of the essence in these transactions sometimes, and we demonstrate our professionalism and our preparedness by being able to respond quickly and efficiently to some of these requests. 
So let's talk about the documents. So we had supporting materials that are optional, but I highly recommend that you have, besides your executive summary, besides your deck, and besides your financial uh, documentation, your cash flow projections, and as well as your, your, your um, um, revenue projections, is your SWOT, your co-founders agreements, Go ahead and have your cap tables, your convertible notes understood, and get familiar with what term sheets are. Any questions about that? Um, here's some best practice and some, and some tips uh, on a high level. So um, I would not recommend that as founders we go out and start getting our idea vetted by pitching um, to various uh, groups. Um, this is not on the job training. This isn't um, a beauty contest with respect to going out and seeing how many pageants we can, we can get into and then come out the winner. We need to go and understand that this requires planning and it requires more than just pulling in different opinions and then using those opinions to craft our, our business story. So think about this. If we are, um, and I did this when I started my, my company, I would talk to whoever wanted to talk to me. Um, I would go out and I would pitch. And what I found out was that was a, a huge waste of time because I thought that I had to get experience pitching, but rather than hiring pitching coaches, which people do, or getting advisors or mentors that can actually assist with polishing the, the business story, we're wasting everybody's time. And we're also polluting the well because Seattle especially is a very small community. And these investors talk and they congregate and they like to compare notes. And I want them to compare notes favorably to us, not the other way. Um, some of the most glaring omissions that I see in documentation, which should be incorporated into our storytelling, I don't see a competitive analysis very often. Um, I'll see reference to a couple of companies, but then when I go ahead and dig a little deeper and try to parse out what it is that I'm seeing, I'm not able to easily understand from the founder how their product is different. And so they create these really nice matrix and these really nice charts, but they can't explain why. I had a company I'm working, I have a company I'm working with right now who's in a space where Groupon exists and where Yelp exists. And um, the founder shorthanded like most of us are, but created a competitive analysis that just really didn't make any sense and started plotting and figuring out, well, where it looks right and where, which quadrants should each party be in. But when it really came down to it, they hadn't gone through the thought process, the team hadn't, in understanding where that actually fits because someone who understands that space is going to know the variables, is going to know the players, and if we misplace in the wrong quadrant or can't substantiate why that, why that competitor is different, then we're going to have a huge problem with um, credibility. I don't see a lot of discussions about, about product market fit. Um, it's just, it doesn't exist in a lot of different decks. I think we should uh, be, be, be weary of that. Um, I don't see um, meaningful projections. I like to see defensible projections that I can sit down with someone and talk to and ask how they actually arrived at those numbers. Uh, value propositions um, overlooked. Um, those, are, those are missing. But here's the, here's the key. One of the best practice techniques I can impart upon you today is to do your homework on who it is that you're talking to. I mentioned earlier about this phenomenon of dipping the toe in the water and just thinking that we're going to get all this great learning by pitching live and getting critiqued. But again, there's pitch coaches to do that. We have the obligation on behalf of our company to make sure that we are going to find the right investor. In my company, when I, after I bootstrapped and raised venture capital, I discovered after the marriage that the marriage partnership really wasn't very good. And I didn't really do the degree of due diligence that I think a lot of us owe it to ourselves because it could be fraught with a lot of problems. So identifying the right investor is going to be key because it's going to get you on a fast trajectory. It's going to demonstrate that you value their time and that you've done your homework. But by far the biggest issue that I see um, and one best practice technique that, um, that please take this away today, 
there are so many companies that I, that I come across that don't have any customer feedback data points. There's none. If we're building a phone app, that's okay. It's a low barrier to entry, you can onboard quickly, and if you have some influencers or have some good connections, you can get some traction quickly. But if we're talking about the world of getting people to buy our product, and I believe that the investment community is becoming much more um, discreet, and they're much more discriminating in what they're going to be putting money into these days, I had a client who was a director of a public traded company locally. Um, he and his team spent a year and a half developing an absolute marvelous piece of software. Um, and then what happened was, uh, went out to raise money and there was no customer feedback. And then what happened was they had the entire company's future because everybody was getting very um, uh, desperate, if you will. Uh, the time uh, frames had, had very much shrunk and they were on a very short fuse. And so they had to go out and find a pilot project partner because this was a very sophisticated piece of, of, of software. And what happened was when they went out to go talk to this, this beta customer with virtually a finished product, the beta customer wanted to ask and, and wanted to see what data they had from earlier clients because the, the product was really ready to go. It didn't really need a pilot project, but they had no data points. And so somebody in a $700 million company whose job is on the line, if something goes wrong, I mean, you've got a CMO, you got a CTO, you got, you got your CIO, you got your COO. I mean, these are serious companies, and who's gonna put their job on the line to work with a company that can't, bring, can't even bring data about customer interaction? It's, it's very frustrating. So I want you to think about the difference between wishful thinking that the customers will come versus taking our product to the customers at whatever stage it is and getting feedback. Some next steps, pardon me. <clears throat> Let's set some SMART goals. We all know what SMART goals are. I didn't invent it, but how many of us do it? And the most important element in my view about SMART goals is the timing issue. A goal does not make any sense unless it's tied to some timetable or some time interval. And we need to set either 15 or 30 or even 90 day plans, but we don't do it because we think that that's not important, but it's super important. Because how can we measure something if the time frame is so, is so long that it doesn't really make a difference? Uh, I also would suggest that we create a project plan. And the, product, the, the project plan is not just for the product, but it's for your story as well. And so think about parallel tracks. And if, you're, if your product is already so far ahead that you need to go back and create all of, these, all of these documents for your story, that's okay. But make sure that you create a project plan for both because there, there is gonna need to be some similarity in the timing of when those two documents or when those two sets of plans are gonna meet. Uh, a, a really important uh, thing about being uh, successful is to create um, an advisory team. Um, I can't stress enough, there are programs out there like the one that I'm working with now where it's no cost, no fee, it's confidential and the taxpayer subsidize these programs that it's really important to go and see if you can get access to some people in the community who are experienced and who are generous with their time and will try to impart some advice um, for you so you can um, avoid this, some of those learning curves. The one time a month uh, advisors or directors, I find just doesn't work. Um, how can we get advice from someone who's gonna come in for one hour a month and look at our documents and understand the full, the full story? If you think about all the people in our, in our system, um, ecosystem who are involved with startups, they're sometimes working with 20 or 30 startups and they're maybe on 10 boards. I just would question whether or not those companies um, are getting the best advice that they can because um, it's just an element of time and I think it's important to get people who are gonna be committed to your business and also do so on a level of saturation that's actually gonna produce some meaningful events and results. Okay, so the summary. So we talked about this minimum viable story. Um, I suggest that you please create a roadmap for your, for your product as well as for your story. Please build all the models. 
Again, we're not talking about uh, the super thick phone book business plan approach. We're talking about a set of streamlined documents, and ostensibly it's very, they, they seem very simple, but they're really not simple because it's a lot of wordsmithing. It's a lot of discovery. It's a lot of, it's a lot of revisions, and it's a lot of pulled out hair. But we have to build those models because the choice may be that we don't move forward in our business. I mean, that would be responsible. What's not responsible is to continue going on a path where we're lulling ourselves into this belief that because we have a product, people are gonna buy it and we haven't done all the background homework and information collecting that we need to make informed decisions. Please know your audience. Know your customer, know your investors, and also know your strategic partners. Um, this company I was referring to that went to this pilot project with this $700 million company didn't realize that the company did not have the budget after all the contract negotiation was done and they're filling in all the details. The founder didn't realize that the company didn't have the budget to execute on the, on the plan. Uh, please do your homework. Um, there's no substitute for that and there's a lot of people who put time into the product, put it in the story please. Uh, get accountable and stay accountable. Get someone to hold your feet to the fire. I don't mean a spouse or a partner, because that doesn't work. Again, there's a lot of resources out in the marketplace. I'm happy afterwards to give you some ideas and some leads of some groups that are non nonprofit, provide those kind of services that at least you can hopefully get some data points. Keep your expectations reasonable. But reasonable doesn't mean modest, okay? I want us to set the bar super high. But to set the bar high, we have to practice and we have to build up to that. So whatever you do, please make an informed decision, make sure you have all the facts, and good luck in your businesses, and I uh, hope to see you soon. And that's the end because the, we're on quick poll, so. <laughs> We're a few slides after that. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions now, or we could um, you can break and do do one on one, whatever you like to do. Yes. Yeah, so I'm an inventor. I'm working with an industry partner, and uh, we're working towards that minimum viable product. They keep their cards really close to their chest. They won't give me any information. It's a private company. Um, what should I be asking for? Because in some ways, I'm looking towards a commercial commercialization of this intellectual property, two patents worth or three patents worth. And, and so what can I ask them and get some response about the commercialization plan? Do you have an MOU? Yeah. And you have non-disclosure agreements. So how high up in the food chain have you have you been talking? Is it on the on the C level? Is it VP level? Where where is it? It's a small company, so we have a SBIR right now. Okay, and do you? We are talking. I am having lunch with the owner. Okay, and um, have you determined whether or not that partner has the capability of fulfilling the agreement? Yes, they're, they're an international company. They have potential. Okay, so at what point in this process? are you gonna decide whether you have to walk or whether or not you have to push a little harder to get information that you need to decide whether or not this is a viable opportunity for both companies and they intend on, on following through with it? Um, I think we're at that stage right now. Yeah, so very, very delicate, right? But there has to be some reason why they're not doing what you expect and if it's um, something within your control, then I would say um, gingerly push, um, but know that there could be some fallout. You know, this is the problem where if companies come together and they start to collaborate, and then all of a sudden something stalls, or something not, is not quite working out the way that both parties thought, then I think it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to try to figure out why. And there has to be some, some reason there. Um, Can I just... Sure. Go ahead a little bit. I don't understand the jargon very well, but my sense is, even though they won't tell me, that they haven't done the, the work that you suggested here. And I would like to encourage them to think ahead that way. What should I ask for? Um, have you seen financials? No, they won't let me do that. 
Um, have you done an IP search? Yes. So you know that there's IP and there's, have you done a credit, a credit check on the company? No. Have you done a background check on the founders? No. So um, I'm not saying that there's something wrong, but I'm saying that is the next step because something doesn't, doesn't make sense. And it could be because they have lack of financial capability or internal expertise. And so I would just encourage you to flesh that out as much as possible. Yes. Hi, um, I'm a founder of a, a startup and we finally finished our MVP. Congratulations. Um, and the problem that we're running into is we're testing it out on people. And from every single person that we test it out on, it's, oh, well, I would do it this way or I would like it this way. And how do we avoid, because our resources are so limited, making these drastic changes off just a few people's feedback, how do we know that we're, I mean, at what point do you, um, if all the feedback is different, at what point do you know that, well, I just have to keep going with what I have? Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, if there's a lot of disparity with the feedback that you're getting, then you may have um, a sample pool that isn't representative of what your customer really wants. And so maybe part of that process is to, to be a little more specific, um, a little more maybe selective in who you're working with. Um, because if we're not working with the right people, obviously then you're gonna encounter those kind of issues. And then you're gonna, you and your team are gonna be frantically trying to solve each one of these problems. But um, are, you, are you doing any, any data collection and figuring out which uh, themes are common amongst all those, all those customer feedback um, surveys? No, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think we're testing it out on people who aren't really our ideal customer. Um, and we need to make that leap into defining who those people are and then, and then asking them to test it out. So, um, it's hard, It's hard, you know, as a startup not to, even when friends and family are like, oh, I would never do that or I would never use that, it's hard not to, you know, take that personally, like, oh, that's my baby I've been working on for years. So um, I think that that's, that's probably what I need to do is target other people. I, I found that friends and family um, are always willing to help, but they offer the worst advice. <laughs> Right, because they're emotionally invested in what we're, what we're doing. Um, I think that would be helpful. Um, yeah, this is all going back to who our customer is. And I had a client a couple of years ago, um, was um, an executive at a software company on the east side, um, managed 18 people and um, a eight figure budget, um, and came to me with a business idea. And what this person wanted to do was create uh, an app a very unique app, at least um, this person thought it was. So this person went out and started doing some data collection and had friends and families and, and friends of, uh, of, of the daughter come in and he had this, this test um, market or t uh, test case of about 700 people. Well, the problem was during the course of those discussions, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of blurred lines, and so the company had to pivot and when it pivoted, it recognized that the information that it got was so unusable that it had to go ahead and aim for a different customer. So all the work, all the testing, all the data collection was all for naught because it wasn't even properly, properly structured. And so when the company had to pivot and had a uh, uh, um, SMB as a customer and not um, individuals, it was a very challenging time and the company ended up closing. In the back. Um, so uh, you were talking about doing due diligence and like background checks with the founders. Um, I'm wondering how valuable having um, other startup experience is for startups that haven't worked out, and at what point that counts against you. So like if I've done like three versus like ten that haven't worked out. Great, great question. Everybody hear the question? So what we're talking about here is when we're doing due diligence, um, what other attributes or factors come into some of that, uh, some of that um, review and does experience come into play? Uh, domain expertise is really important, but it doesn't mean formal training, right? We can have domain expertise if we've gotten our, our teeth sharp on what we're building and we have some, um, some point of reference to demonstrate that we've actually gained some traction in our, in, our, in our business idea, that is great domain expertise. 
what I'm talking about with respect to background checks, if you will, is if we have a large customer or prospective customer and they're not moving, how do we get, how do we get to the next point? There could be something else there. The most important attribute of any business, though, is, is team. And it's hard to understand why team would be more important than product. But in, in many investors' eyes, it is more important. Because a good team can execute on a multitude of different, different business ideas. Um, look at the PayPal mafia, right? I mean, you've got examples in business where, where entrepreneurs have, have done new businesses out of industry, out of market, that they had no expertise in. But because they were able to bring in others and, and slice the pie fairly and equitably, they were incredibly successful. So team is super important. Domain expertise is important. Um, but as far as understanding who you're working with, if I were to join a company as a co-founder, which a lot of companies do, right? They realize and acknowledge that they haven't gotten the full team together. And they may have some feedback from some investors that say, look, we need to round out the team. Right? That could be a very expensive process because your only currency is what, is what stock you have or what, how many shares you have in your, in your employee stock, stock plan, right? And those investors are gonna most likely, or those co-founders are gonna be most likely investors as well. Um, and uh, they're gonna want a chunk, of the, a chunk of the pie. So think about team building early on, know who you're doing business with, um, and you can acquire domain expertise um, as you're doing your business. There was a question in the back. We have a question from our Spokane live streaming group. You said to research potential investors. What tools do you suggest that we use? I would start in your local community, and uh, Spokane may not have a vibrant um, uh, VC community or angel community, um, but there are some great resources locally that you should begin to, to, to research. Um, I would begin to look at some of the investment clubs in town and just get a lay of the land, because in that part of the state, there are a lot of high net worth individuals who are looking for opportunities to, to diversify portfolios, and they are within ecosystems we just have to find them. Um, as far as um, other, other tools go, I mean, I think that um, Gust has some really great resources. Um, of course, um, Angel Co. does as well. There are a lot of online databases uh, with TechCrunch and others, so you can, you can find them. Um, but I, I think that a lot of investors um, want local projects. Otherwise, they'll syndicate, and you can work with a San Francisco entity, and then they'll have investors from all over the world. But depending on the size of your business and where you are in your growth, that maybe starting locally is best. Get familiar, you know, get, 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 your, get your feet wet, if you will, with understanding who's out there. I'm not advocating pitching, but I'm advocating going out and networking and seeing who's, who's, there, who's there locally. There's a, another question back here. Uh, one of the points you mentioned was the need for customer feedback. How do you start on that? Like how do you start getting customer feedback if the product you're looking after is not something you can make available like a, super, like a website, but it's more of an infrastructure thing and the customer will potentially other business. Great question. So how do, you, how do you connect with a customer if you're working on a larger scale project and it's not feasible to reach out to individuals? Um, so I have some clients who have created consortium agreements with larger companies. So um, early on in the process, um, these founders had some incredible technical skills. And so they were able to do their research and find out which participants in that industry could be su suitable partners. And so they went ahead and they approached the venture arms of those, of those groups, but they also went ahead and looked at some of, the, some of the Edgar filings to see what kind of movement has been with some of those larger publicly traded companies, which some of my clients do, do work with, and they're able to understand whether or not that larger, larger entity is a prospective customer. So the individual um, barriers are high because we have a lot of people who are wanting to help us, like we heard heard earlier. But if you're an SMB or working with a with a larger with a larger company and a larger solution like the hypothetical um, company that I gave you before, um, we really we need to go ahead and just focus on making sure that um, we're going to build something that somebody wants. Um, but before we do that, we need to look and see um, which participants are in that marketplace that may want our service. 
service and then go ahead, or our product, and go ahead and reach out to them and see if we can get, um, get, get some dialogue. Um, another client of mine, um, was working with um, HTC, um, really interesting, and um, HTC sold their patent portfolio to another company, and it left the company hanging high and dry. So it doesn't always mean that if there is some some uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration that actually uh, produces fruit, because these companies are constantly uh, rotating um, business units and entities within those organizations, and they're not going to tell us when they're going to pull the plug. Yes. Uh, so my question is related to IP. Um, uh, in my case, uh, there's working on a software uh, product in there. Uh, in the past, I had uh, one or two uh, freelancers contribute to the code base uh, without having papers, without having a uh, contract, or uh, like they, they got paid, but I don't have paperwork. So uh, I probably have to clarify the transfer of IP from them to me. Um, what shape should that take? What do people expect, like an investor, expect to see to, to have that be cleaned up? So there's two different um, bodies of, of IP, if you will. Um, and again, um, I'm an active member of the bar, but I'm not rendering legal advice. Um, and I'm not a member of the patent bar. So um, there are two different bodies of law, right? One is, um, is the IP with patents and trademarks and copyrights, and the other is trade, trade secrets, right? And so what happens is, and you can consult with your lawyers about this, what happens is early stage companies, what we do is we try to pull in resources, and we don't always paper the trail properly. And so we get people working on handshakes and understandings, the, the glitch that I see is when we begin a due diligence process, um, we really should have that three ring binder and that notebook that has our work for hire agreements. And if they're not work for hire, um, then they're gonna be um, you know, paid, paid staff, um, full-time staff. And um, you really need to talk to the lawyer to figure out how to um, rememorialize some of those understandings. Um, because there's a lot of leakage in those kind of agreements, and once the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to put back in there. So I'd recommend seeing a lawyer. Um, a really best practice is to make sure you paper all of your agreements up front. Um, if they aren't papered already, um, hope that the integrity of the people you're working with is such that they will agree to sign after the fact. But again, as time goes on, more and more improvements are made, the IP becomes more valuable, it gets harder to get people to relinquish rights that they may have done so verbally or very early on in, in, the, in the company stage. But as a product gets, gets further along, they sometimes see they have leverage um, and they want to apply that leverage appropriately for them. Any more questions? Okay, well thank you very much for today. I apologize for the technical glitches, but um, have a great weekend, and um, thank you to CoMotion. Thank you to the, to the staff. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, I enjoy it. I know a lot of successful founders who are at CoMotion Labs headquarters and Startup Hall. Um, thank you for, our, for your support and for having me here today.